Must I die too? King Gilgamesh weeps. The tavern keeper warns Gilgamesh that the life of a man is short. Only the gods can live forever. But Gilgamesh is undeterred and sets out on a journey to find a secret key to immortality. Now, while Gilgamesh failed due to being finessed by a f***ing snake, that does not mean that we are all to fail too. Or maybe we are. Ladies and gentlemen, today we'll be discussing none other than increasing your lifespan from a strictly scientific perspective. Today's video was inspired by Hacking Darwin by Jamie Metzl. Why is it that our muscles begin to lose their fibers when we're just about in our 20s? That our bodily functions peak in our late 20s, that our chances of death doubles every 8 years starting at 30, and that our cells begin to lose their ability to repair dangerous mutations at around 40. For the overwhelming majority of history, the average human lifespan has been quite short. If you didn't die in childbirth or through one of the countless infections in your early years, chances are that later in life you'd be killed by some accident or a predator. Hence, the average lifespan for humans was only about 18. By 1900, it was a whopping 47 in the United States, by then one of the most advanced countries in the world. Today, the average lifespan worldwide is about 72, 79 in the United States, 85 in Japan, even though it's only around 50 in many of the poorest African countries, unfortunately. The first step in exploring how long we could potentially be able to live in the future, we must understand what aging is. While everyone understands aging intuitively, aging is actually extremely complex. Some scientists have thought of aging as a series of changes that make an organism more likely to die, others as a progressive decline in ability to do things, others as an increase in inflammation levels or oxidative damage to the body, and even others as a decline in the body's ability to activate the stem cells needed to keep cells in good repair. Whatever the definition is, aging is the leading cause of death among humans since the diseases that kill most of us are diseases of aging. Heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, for example, account for over half the deaths within the United States. Curing any one of these diseases doesn't really help too much since you'll still end up getting f***ed by another one at the end of the day. You could eliminate all the cancer in the United States and life expectancy will only go up by about three to four years. In conclusion, if we really want to extend our overall lifespan, we'll need to worry less about countering each of these individual diseases and rather how to slow aging itself. With that said, let's begin investigating. Scores of studies have reportedly shown that calorie restriction extends the life of yeast, flies, worms, mice, rats, and many other organisms too. Studying this effect in mammals, and of course humans, is very difficult though since we are living for much longer, making the studies take significantly longer to conclude. Nonetheless, starting in the 80s, scientists set up a few studies to measure the impact of calorie restriction on macaque, a monkey that shares 93% the same DNA as humans. The calorie restricted monkeys live an average of three years longer and remain on average healthier than the others living in the same conditions but with non-restricted calories. At least four of the monkeys in one of these studies exceeded all previous records for the longest lived macaques in captivity. In other words, these were beyond promising results for this theory. Now, why is this? Why is this happening? Why does eating less result in a longer life? Well, it's actually quite simple. As you eat in a caloric deficit, your metabolism begins to decline. A lower metabolism metabolism leads to a decreased rate of living. A lower metabolism thus translate to less wear and tear on the cells, less work for them. Now, this is not to suggest that you should attempt to always eat in a caloric deficit that would actually be impossible since your metabolism would eventually continue to adjust until it got to a point where you would not be consuming sufficient calories to survive. So you definitely could go too far to an unhealthy point with this. However, some occasional caloric deficits or even short water fast may be beneficial to one's long term health since it can reduce your metabolism and then you could choose to maintain that metabolism at a new maintenance caloric level. So perhaps we should reconsider how hard today's society is pushing the body positivity agenda. I personally see it as irresponsible to the human species as it influences people to disregard their health. Cancel me if you wish, but I think we need to start acknowledging the health implications of this rather than just virtue signaling to seem like good people and for companies to boost their ESG score. Again, I'm not suggesting long-term caloric deficits, but what I can say say is that long-term caloric surpluses certainly have a negative effect on your lifespan and overall health since your metabolism will be higher and thus causing your cells more wear and tear. To add on to this, a recent comprehensive study followed more than 650,000 people for an average of 10 years and analyzed nearly 
and death records in an attempt to quantify the benefits of exercise on lifespan. The study found that 75 minutes a week of moderate exercise led to almost two years of added life expectancy compared to sitting on a couch frequently. Adding 2.5 to 5 hours of exercise a week added 3.5 years and an hour a day or 450 minutes per week added about 4.5 years to life expectancy. Well, okay, so reducing your metabolism and exercising might lead to a couple extra years of your life best case, but that's still not amazing. Nonetheless, it is still worth noting. What about the super agers? People who live over 100 years old like Jean Kalman. What the f*** is she doing? Well, it's actually less about what she's doing and more about her winning the genetic lottery in these cases. Introducing Nur Barzilai, director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and one of the world's greatest experts on aging. Nur and other researchers found that while many people over 100 would be expected to pick up diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and cardiovascular diseases at higher percentages, somehow these people over 100 didn't. His team zeroed in on a gene APIPOQ, common in most people, but absent in these superagers, which seems to protect them from inflammation in the arteries. Other researchers have identified tens of genes that, in one expression or another, seem to protect against brain disorder and inflated cholesterol levels, provide additional protection against Alzheimer's, and generally increase lifespan. More and more of these genes are being identified at a rapid pace now. With that said, as more people have their DNA sequenced, more of these will be identified. And with that said, people having children through IVF embryo selection may be able to select embryos with these genes or lack of genes depending on which one of course. As genetic engineering progressive, perhaps intentional modifications can even be made for this. I'd suggest watching one of my most recent videos on genetic engineering here to give some more insight on this. But this wouldn't really help you anyway, a living person. It would only help your future child in the distant future. Nonetheless, it is also still worth noting. One reason that our ability to repair damaged DNA declines as we get older is that the levels in cells of a molecule called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD plus decreases as we age. The NAD molecules amplify the activity of a group of seven spatial genes called sirtuins to augment their ability to repair damaged DNA. The more NAD in the cells, the better able they are to fix the problems. When Harvard scientist David Sinclair and his colleagues genetically engineered mice to express high sirtuin levels or used NMN to increase their NAD levels, they found the mice had a better organ function, endurance, disease resistance, blood flow, and longevity compared to the other mice of the same age. Although human trials are just starting, the market is already booming for NMN and NR pills as unregulated supplements. Another drug that shifts the balance of cellular activity from growth to repair mode is metformin. In fact, doctors have been prescribing it since the 50s, but not for the same reason you might think. In 1994, the US FDA approved it as a treatment in helping diabetics keep their blood sugar levels in check. Today, 80 million prescriptions are filled every year in America for it. A 2005 study found that metformin reduced the risk of cancer in diabetics. Now, a 2014 study found that diabetics taking it not only live longer than diabetics not taking it, but they even outlived the control non-diabetic patients as well. Male mice given the drugs lived an average of 6% longer than those weren't as well. With all these findings, scientists concluded that metformin was not just impacting a few individual diseases, but rather having a systematic effect on entire organisms, making people more like those centenarians with the blessed genetics like Gene Kalman. This makes sense since insulin tells our cells it's time to grow. Too much of it, like overeating at the dessert bar, our cells overinvest in growth at the expense of repair. When we moderate our insulin uptake through diet, exercise, caloric restriction, or metformin, the cells shift back to repair mode. This helps us reduce oxidative stress like the quahog clams, which could live for hundreds of years and better fight diseases like naked mole rats. NAD boosters and metformin may be some of the first drugs that target aging, but they are certainly not the last. Another drug that's proven to extend life in all animals tested in studies around the world is rapamycin. Rapamycin's natural ability to slow the proliferation and growth of targeted cells made it an ideal immunosuppressant ideal for preventing people's immune systems from rejecting transplanted organs. But then, doctors began to notice that people taking it seemed to be healthier than similarly situated animals and people taking other drugs. They later discovered that this too was triggering a shift from growth to repair in cells just like metformin was doing. The Quahog clam 
I mentioned earlier, could live for hundreds of years because it slows its metabolism and thus shifts its energy of its cells from growth to repair. Hence, it makes sense that a drug causing the same effect could also improve longevity. Regardless, this drug in particular is not suggested since it suppresses the immune system, leaving one vulnerable to too many other diseases. When it comes to this drug, it's more of uh, making the best out of a bad situation because obviously, if you need a transplant to live, you're willing to sacrifice some other things. Moving on, when we're young and healthy, our cells divide regularly to replace themselves. As we get older, some of them stop dividing. Rather than dying and getting flushed out though, these zombie-like senescent cells secrete molecules causing increasing levels of inflammation and tissue damage. Now this isn't entirely a bad thing though, since they also help suppress the growth in cancer cells and tumors. We wouldn't want to get rid of them completely. It would rather be better to prune them. After scientists genetically engineered and then activated a transgenetic suicide gene in mice, they not only lived 25% longer, but they also regrew lost hair and stronger muscles and better functioning organs. And now the race is on to develop and test a new class of drugs called senolytic designed to prune senescent cells to treat specific diseases of aging and potentially expand both health span and lifespan. Now, there's also been some extremely interesting studies regarding blood swapping. Now, just because the TV shows and movies make it seem cliche, that doesn't take away from the fact that there's a lot of scientific evidence backing this. Hence, this is actually something I'm considering making a dedicated video to in the future. As of now, though, that is about it for today. In conclusion, if you don't have gifted genetics like Gene Kalman did, your best option is to shift your cell's activity from growth to repair to increase your lifespan. At least, that's what we could do as of now. While I can't advocate taking any drugs I mentioned today, what I can suggest is exercising regularly and not overeating. I'm not going to suggest to you guys to go on fast or even temporary deficits, but I'm going to suggest that you not overeat in a surplus. Anyway, I'm no doctor, I don't know shit. I just read a really interesting book and this was one of the chapters that I did want to share with you guys. I'll leave the link for Hacking Darwin in the description if you're interested in reading it. Anyway, subscribe for more thought provoking content like this and share with a buddy. Stay curious, stay skeptical, have a great day.